Again, thank you everyone. Welcome to the fourth of five webinars um, uh, with myself. And I want to thank the trading pit. And just real quick, if anyone has questions, please to um reach out to Alex in the chat or email Alex. Um, there's a free three chapter that come with this um, of my book, The Global Macro Edge. So um if you can if you can uh you know reach out to Alex with any questions or anything we can't answer, I'm gonna be pumping pretty hard info for the next 34 minutes here. <coughs> so if you guys buckle up, um, we'll get to, we'll get through this. All right, good stuff. So, um, so we've had four webinars already, and or sorry, three webinars already. This is now the fourth, and we've talked about building a business plan. We've talked about, um, you know, the netto number. Um, we've gone over, you know, just some of the things that you should be thinking about uh, when it comes to that. And of course, we talked about, you know, building a trading journal. Uh, you know, so business plan trading journal, and then and then specifically the netto number in terms of how to compartmentalize and how to assess um, risk, how to generate returns, and how to create great returns per unit of risk. So now today um, is number four or five, and then in two weeks from now, we'll come back with really harnessing your intuition, understanding the psychological aspects, which I think are profoundly important from a risk management standpoint. So please, whatever you do, in two weeks from now, be here or um, or, or watch the recorded version of that. It, it's going to be filled with a ton of information, and I'll touch a little bit more on that at the end here. But when it comes to trading economic data, um, I've been doing this for over a decade, really 15 years, um, since 2008, um, incorporating um, economic data via algorithmic trading methodologies. And so I'm going to focus on one thing today because I think it's topical, or I, it is topical, and that is we have the Fed meeting coming out next Wednesday, um, January 31st. Today being, of course, the, the 22nd. Check the date there, make sure I'm right. The 22nd of January. And so the first question that kind of hits everyone in this in this very visceral way, and that is what you know, what the hardest part of the of trading the Fed is. And this in the last Fed meeting we had, of course, was quite eventful. But that is, do you fade that initial spike or do you go with it? Right. And so if you see that spike or you see that big, 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 you know. Um, candle down on your charts. Wow, is that a move that you go with? Oh my goodness, is this, a, is this something really big or is it going to be faded and, and it's going to just reverse back the other way? And so today I'm going to begin to break down the methodology that, that I've used and then really what, how you can take what I've done, at least in a general way, and then incorporate that into your own trading methodology. So for me, I built um, literally over 10 years um, what's called impact trading software. And and this software is something that I've used um, internally to help just manage my own portfolio. Um, like I've mentioned before, I'm a full time law school student, and so I go to you know I go to law school um, in the afternoons and evenings, and I and I still you know manage my 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 own portfolio during the day. And and one of the uh, skills and tools I've used for that, um, you know, when I was like just you know at it 16 hours a day. I don't I don't spend 16 hours a day in front of the screens anymore um, for my health for health reasons, but I do, you know, watch the markets very closely, and and part of what, what's helped me become more efficient is proprietary software that um, is called Impact Impact Software that I created from my needs that I had in terms of managing risk around um, these events. Okay, and so I want to share with you some of the general things that I do that I think you can that can be incorporated into the uh, into the process. All right, uh, and and I wrote and I this thing took about five thousand hours. 2,500 programming hours, about 2,500 developmental testing hours. That was in the first six or seven years. More since then. Um, also, I wrote this um, for the as, as I was writing the Global Macro Edge. So if you read chapter 20 of the Global Macro Edge, it goes into a, a fair amount of detail on what I did in terms of the, the challenges I faced building proprietary software, the mistakes I made, many of them monetarily um, punitive. <laughs> Uh, and I sort of laugh about that in terms of the, some of the stuff I did early on. And you think, why would you do that? And in retrospect, why would I do that? But I guess I did. So, but nonetheless, though, um, having this automated process, going through this process, some of the best practices um, have helped, have definitely helped me um, uh, become a, a better, a better trader and, 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 and more successful and ultimately end up in, in the Market Wizards book. Um, so what is Impact Software? I created it. Um, and, and impact stands for market price action or impact of an event. Um, it, it synthesizes breaking news into a tradable score. So whether that's FOMC, the BOE, non-farm payroll, CPI, you name it, um, it can do it. Um, 
It allows me to build a very bespoke scoring model because as I'm going to discuss, each one of these Fed events, while it while there is always like a historical analog, <clears throat> the reality is the data behind the Fed is, is relatively limited in terms of the sort of sample sets that most system developers like. And there's a very qualitative um, aspect to what each Fed event encapsulates. So if it's a Fed event that, you know, that, that comes out now, finding a like for like economic analog is going to be very difficult. And so it's going to require a lot of qualitative real time stuff, which is which is actually, I think, quite <clears throat> which is what creates the opportunity for for traders who maybe aren't running a $10 billion portfolio. And once one thing that people ask me is, well, well, you know, my biggest weakness is I need more capital. Well, no, that's maybe your biggest strength because you can you can, you know, get into situations where maybe liquidity isn't the issue. So these events, um, when there's a surprise in the market, as I'm going to show you from some of these examples, big time portfolio managers, there's simply not enough liquidity for them to get do all the business they have to do. And you can you can see follow through on these sort of Fed policy change events that may last hours, even days. And that's an opportunity for the, the, the person who maybe isn't constrained by such large assets to come in and potentially, potentially generate outsized returns as a consequence of that. Okay. Um, so for me, just a little more about sort of what, what I'm dealing with, the technology aggregates information from that statement. So the Fed statement comes out, <clears throat> reads it based on a, a series of inputs I tell it to do. Um, obviously in under a second, and that goes probably without saying, um, even under a millisecond. Uh, but but creates both a tactical and strategic um, score. So I, I like to look at these events from the standpoint of like what it means the next hour or two, and then what it means the next week or two, even the next month or two. And so that that tactical score that I create is a short term score, and then I do a strategic score, which is a long term score. And you know, optimally you want them to be like both long, you know, short term and long term. This is this is significant. Because those are the events that can really generate the 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 outsized the outsized returns. If it's short term significant but long term insignificant, obviously it would stand to reason that you need to be more nimble on your exits and maybe even on your entries and a little more selective on your entries. Um, you can't just you know go pay whatever um, if it's only short term significant but long term insignificant or long term you know effective or marginally significant. So those are things to, to, to keep in mind for yourself. You can just ask yourself that. You don't need a computer to do that. You individually can ask that and, and, and synthesize that into your model. Okay, so <clears throat> I follow the central banks pretty closely, as you probably got that vibe from the first three webinars. Um, and the fact I wrote a book called The Global Macro Edge. Uh, I, when it comes to these bespoke scoring models, and I follow the banks, central banks closely, I also determine kind of what the key events are, like what is the market, market focusing in? That takes some time. And, and unfortunately, you know, I've had, you know, some good relationships and, and able to, to spend time on, all right, you know, looking through this, what would matter the most? And 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 the process of doing this, you, you kiss, you kiss a lot of toads um, before you find a before you find a princess, <laughs> I guess. And so working through those, okay, will this matter? Will that matter? Maybe not, maybe will, maybe okay. Um, and then I go ahead and then weight those factors. So if the Fed comes and addresses, you know, a point about, um, you know, the labor market, all right, well, at a point in time, the labor market <laughs> may have been more significant six months ago. It still matters now, but just simply not as much. And so the dynamic reweighting of those factors um, is something that, you know, takes, takes a little bit of work and takes some ingenuity on to make that happen. Um, impact renders, uh, it renders a quantitative score, but for the, for the sake of making this easy, uh, for the Fed events, <clears throat> let's just distill this down into, you know, anything from very hawkish to very dovish and neutral. So there's seven points of contact there. And I think if you, as you're grading this at home, you can, you know, do the tactical grade, that short-term market reaction, and then the medium longer-term market reaction, that, that strategic grade. And so the index generates, you know, two grades for each event. So, you know, in the short term, it can be very hawkish. That's if the, if the quantitative score is like very high, like, whoa, this is really hawkish. Conversely, um, if, if the quantitative score is very low, I'll, I'll just put that into a very dovish. And I would say that people out there are like, okay, you know, on, on a pendulum, establish what your criteria are. And, and I'm not unique in saying to do this, but, you know, but the, but the factors of how one accomplishes that and then, and then incorporating the overall market narrative into that is kind of where a lot of the secret sauce is. And, and, you can, and again, you can um, capitalize that in, in a variety of ways. All right. So kind of 
distilling the, the you know there may be six eight ten fifteen different factors that come in I, I compartmentalize them or distill them down to four different main things um <clears throat> the first is the central bank's assessment of the economy it stands it stands the reason you know through implicate by implication that if the assessment of the economy uh, economy on balance is good then um the prospect for you know monetary policy would correspondingly be more hawkish on balance not totally but on balance okay the next thing in there that i look at in terms of these four factors is is what their thoughts are on inflation um both currently and, and prospectively um also the path of rate hikes so like what what is it that you know where do they see so maybe the economy's good inflation they think is going to go up but you know the path of rate hikes they still want to you know keep things the same or Vice versa, that even though the economy is maybe so so and inflation is maybe so so, they might still want to keep rates higher for a while um, to be totally sure. So that's why I'm, I'm incorporating those. And lastly, you know, what I talk about is idiosyncratic variables that may influence the market's reaction. And that deals with like operation twist or, or operation, you know, um, any of these Fed operations when it comes to rebalancing their portfolio. They may decide that they want to, you know, sell or increase the pace of bond sales you know so all things being equal that could actually be a hawkish development or conversely they might they may want to slow down bond sales and so that's that fourth factor so <clears throat> while i program all these things ultimately still it's you know i'm overseeing this because these are computers and and stuff happens you know to put it mildly and you know i'm there but but these four factors you can take and probably assess this within a minute or two and put yourself in a pretty good spot, you know, or at least a better spot than if you're sitting around and, and waiting for, you know, wait, waiting for the market to go away. You can at least be proactive in making an assessment. And, you know, is this something that you can like master overnight? Uh, like a lot of things that are worth knowing, there's going to be a commitment and sacrifice to developing those things, taking notes on those things, co being committed to learning these things. And it's 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 kind of how we all get better. And I think this is a good good month of the year to look yourself and say, okay. As a practical matter, what would it take for me to do this? What would it take for me to to know these four things, or at least start by going back, you know, back six or eight or twelve Fed meetings and started sort of starting a log for yourself and reading through the things and 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 looking at well, how did how would this have scored in my book? What can I learn from this? You know, it's a common thing that a lot of people do when they're trying to you know get into a new a new a new way. So I would I would say that that's pretty that's pretty cool. Um, so look at the next thing. All right, so inflation. Well, you talked about uh you know the fed right now is is you know in november 2021 they made a pretty big about face they turned around in terms of um of inflation not being a problem and we're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates to november 21st when the fed lost a ton of institutional credibility after jerome powell was reappointed uh, all of a sudden inflation was a huge issue and then we saw a series i think three straight 75 basis point hikes um for the fed to play catch up and we're still here now and so the question becomes and has been the question we'll talk about this a little later in a few minutes is you know what is the state of inflation right now and has it come down enough for the fed to begin um easy um on the december 13th meeting uh the impression from the uh from the markets was that the fed is deaf is, is content with where inflation is and they can begin to start easing uh, given you know the 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 intense amount of hiking that went on so we'll see but that's the first thing i look at for the fed meeting coming next week so again like i said wednesday january 23rd we have the fed meeting coming get into it we'll talk about it um, you know we'll, we'll look at what their assessment of inflation is because at that point i think that's what's really driving you know um where they're at and, and that's been a little stop and start looking at the data over the last even month you know it's not been so convincing that like yeah the march is an absolute go and that's why um you know the futures pricing for a fed for a fed uh rate cut is is at about 55 60 percent right now that they cut but that's not you know 80 85 90 percent where it was a couple of weeks ago all right the outlook on the economy uh, again we've had you know obviously the jobs numbers are coming in we've had some manageable cpi stuff but we'll see what the fed says in this statement um typically you can see that in, in a recap in paragraph one on um, paragraph two they they get into a little more detail about some of the global you know economic phenomena they're still talking about the ukraine issue in the second paragraph so we'll see if that gets addressed there's some political probably implications from that and uh and go from there and then the third thing we're looking at is the path of rate hikes uh 
<laughs> you know, the whole language around, you know, some rate, some for the rate hikes may be appropriate. Um, we'll see, you know, what they do in this January statement, because that may, may tee up, um, that could very likely tee up the March statement. So we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, what, what does the Fed see on the path of rate hikes? So, but already, you know, we have three of the four variables. You kind of get a sense of how you could probably grade these out um, and go from, but I think this third one here, this path of rate hikes is going to be, is going to be telling, in other words, what they do with the language in that, in that second paragraph um, will, 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 will kind of guide the market and, and reset, reset the, the interest rate futures accordingly. And then idiosyncratic variables. I don't see this as much of a factor in this coming, you know, um, in this, in this coming statement next week, but it could be a bigger factor because in the March statement, as we, as you guys probably know, or may recall, or maybe just about to learn, the Fed has eight meetings a year. Um, the dot plot meetings are what are called the summary of economic projection meetings happen in March, June, September, and December. And so they come with a corresponding, um, you know, uh, for interest rate projections, Fed funds, futures projections, GDP, core PCE. That's the, the Fed's sort of du jour inflation um, uh, methodology to track inflation, a little different than, than the, the Department of Labor um, or BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics um, CPI number. And then you're looking at that in that regard to, to those things. So uh, I don't see too much on the idiosyncratic variables, but we might that, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's nine weeks till that March meeting. There's obviously next week for, for the, for the, for the Fed meeting, we're in a blackout period right now. So we're not going to hear from any Fed speakers. Um, we could hear from the Wall Street Journal's Nick Timoros if the Fed is uncomfortable with how things are set up, but unlikely, unlikely in a non-set meeting. But I do think that 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 March meeting will be very eventful, um, and uh, having these kind of skills to assess it, I think is going to should should help um, improve your overall process, at least your preparation. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's get get a sample here. Let's get let's get practical. Um, Eighteen minutes in into what when when this manifests itself and the score comes out, by right, what this looks like. And so what I have here is this is a chart from the two year treasuries. I'm from December 13th, just about a month ago, a little over a month ago. And you can see here when the Fed came out with very um, dovish summer of economic projections. So I just mentioned that the, the, the meetings that have the summer of economic projections are, um, you know, they they give us a quantitative means to assess things, right? And, and the Fed funds forecast on that was, you know, basically two grades lower or two, two, two cuts lower for 2024 than what, um, than what the market was more or less pricing in uh, maybe one cut, one cut to be fair, but between one and two, and that came as a surprise. And you see the reaction here, <clears throat> which effectively signaled to to the market that the Fed was done, or at least at least that they could trace that they're done. And here's a, here's a, a chart of two year treasuries. That's in one minute. And you can still see even after one minute, three minutes, five minutes, like you still had a moment to like kind of look through stuff. And 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 again, when I say that there's simply not enough liquidity for these multi multi billion dollar managers to get in and do what they have to do. You don't need to be in the first, at least I don't believe, you need to be in the first three to five seconds, or you need to have that that low latency infrastructure on big regime ships like this, okay? And so that the reality is that there's some opportunity there, and then you can see here that on one futures contract, you know, the, the market was up about $480 on one contract, on a two-year treasury contract in the first minute. It ended up being up $960 and even $1,400 by the end of the day. So still three times more removed to run. That's if you got into the end of the last minute, and that's something that you know that uh, that that that's that that's good to go. Um, here's a look at the S and P 500 futures. Even more profound when you think about you know the impact on that. S and P the first minute was up about seven hundred fifty dollars a contract, about fifteen points. Then it was up thirty points at the end of you know about eight or nine minutes, and it was up sixty points, you know after you know after about an hour. And that's something that you know with, with a lot of fair you know good range inside of there as well. So this was one of those events where it really caught the market by surprise. It was December, you had some seasonal factors, and it really got to move behind it. And by, by using those things, you, know, you can you, you can set that up. Um, here's the look at the euro currency on that day. So again, we've shown fixed income, we've shown equities, now we're going to show euro, or at least at least FX. It's a popular market for you guys here on the trading pit. And again, I just can't, can't thank the trading pit enough. Um, for, you know, as someone who's a, a military veteran, um, you know, just, just helping out veterans is a big, it just means a lot to me. So 
thanks for letting me come on here and and uh and bring awareness and and i just hope everyone you know um th go out and thank thank a veteran all right your currency futures uh we uh again you know up the euro was up 500 dollars in that first minute per contract about you know 45 50 pips about up 110 pips and ultimately 140 pips ish you know round about there um on that day as well so let's go back a little further in time um you know because it's not just this one event but but this has been going on for years so on june 16th this this we had the uh, the opposite effect so going back about two and a half years um you know you're looking at you know a day where the, the, the dot block came out and it was very hawkish much more hawkish than people thought <laughs> this is a day where treasuries you know sold off pretty hard and this is a two-year treasury market here and you can see like whoa the feds you know was priced to be pretty pretty uh pretty aggressive and um this is you know before november 2021 ultimately treasury recovered from this but that day you can see here this is a you know looking at a one minute chart and uh there's a lot of action uh, let's take a look at the next there's the es from june june 16. you can see that the, the smb sold down before fighting its way back but ultimately saying hey wait a second that's hawkish that's bad uh, we're going to move lower we're going to follow interest rates lower and this some of this is what's compounded upon what's called you know the risk parity trade or the 60 40 trade where you know for 10 11 12 years risk parity was probably the trade of the, not probably the trade of the decade when you look at both it from a return per unit of risk perspective and the scalability so there are like great returns but if someone were to say oh i'll go back in time and buy bitcoin like, yes no doubt about it you can go back and buy bitcoin but how much bitcoin could you have bought i mean how much could an a whole economy have bought well, the thing which made the risk parity trade so great is that it is a trade that fundamentally altered the wealth profile of millions and millions, tens of millions of people worldwide, hundreds of millions of people worldwide. Okay. And that's, I think, has to be a factor. No, not, I think that has to be a factor when you think about what a trade of the decade is, less I digress. Um, so looking at the ES from 2021, this is something where, you know, the S&P initially went down on, on the very hawkish outcome, but chopped around. That treasury trade was a, was a more pure trade that day, but the S&P marched to the beat of its own drum sometime, but wanted to show that. <clears throat> now let's go back even further. Let's go to December 19th, um, 21st. And so again, this is another December Fed meeting. We're going back now now five years. Um, and this is a day where the Fed did not, you know, um, take its foot off, take its foot off the, bra the brakes of, of interest rate hikes, trying to slow down the economy. The market thought it would. The Fed did not. We graded it very hawkish. And over the next three days, the S&P lost about 7%. Now let's think about that. The world's largest proxy for risk out there loses 7%. When I talk about the ability for, to, to adapt, this is what I mean, is, is, is if you get a seminal change that is both a, a short-term grade and a long-term grade, this is something that can have a very powerful impact on your portfolio. And the people at the trading pit really you know, wanna educate you guys um, about what this is because this is how wealth can be generated. As you're thinking about how I can build my business and you want to get capital from the trading pit, having an ability that when these market moving events happen, this is why managing risk is so important, is that these events may happen, even if they happen once a year, okay? If you can preserve your capital and not blow yourself up and just be around for a day like this and have the process in place and have the discipline, I think you put yourself in a good position to benefit from this. I mean, nothing's ever guaranteed. There's still that, you still have to execute, but that's where, you know, some optionality can come in and, and, and really refining and developing your business plan so that you can use your capital, use the trading pits capital through through winning contests and through and through that process and, and go from there. But this is event S&P 500 in the matter of, you know, three and a half days, it's down 7%. Think about what the out of the money puts will be, especially now in this day of zero DTE options or zero days of expiration options. Uh, you know, you have an opportunity in, in terms of trading that. All right, here's <clears throat> the, re the reversal on that. Um, after Powell came out and the market reacted so, as abruptly as it did, um, Powell came out and made a speech um, and, and the S&P, sure enough, went and, and traded much higher. So there you go. That was much, much higher. The rebally from that, we graded that, we graded that event very dovish um, and, uh, and literally rock and roll. And that was from this January 30th. Of That's how that goes. Okay, here's something you can look at. This is, this is an older picture of, um, this is the world history of probability. This is on Bloomberg. Um, not that everyone has a Bloomberg, but you know you can 
look at some of the meetings being priced out. This is um middle part of last year. I had this clip and uh and went ahead and and, and wanted to do that, show you guys. Now you can see chance of hike or cut, you know, 74% of a chance of a hike, you know, 30% chance of, 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 of it move ultimately moving lower. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's the that that's a little bit of, of what might give just a quick, you know, topical frame of reference about what um what you can do in that regard. Okay, let's talk a little about the events coming up here um, in the markets of water. So I showed you the S&P, um, the GCE, and this should really say this, this should really say um, SR3, which is, uh, which is the, the SO, SOFR futures, um, which obviously get to, they've effectively displaced the Euro dollar futures. I'm sorry about that. Those are the Fed fund futures I have listed there, but basically you can still track the Fed fund futures. They, they, they still move. They, they, they're still worth watching, but um, SOFR futures are, are pretty live. Um, and let's talk about this week briefly. We have the ECB decision coming up. We have US GDP on Thursday. We have core PCE on Friday. So those are events that, that happen um, at 8.30 a.m. New York time on Thursday, 8.30 a.m. New York time on Friday. We have the ECB coming out um, you know, Wednesday with their, with their decision, uh, yay. And, uh, and, then, and then next week we have the employment cost index coming out in the morning. That's a quarterly number as well. That'll be for Q4. That is a chance to move things. And then we have um, the FOMC statement and press conference um, as well. So those are kind of what's on tap. Um, the S&P driven a little more by um, a little more by, by this AI revolution going on um, and, and, and really the technology component of the S&P. Looking right now, you can't keep the NASDAQ down. It's uh, just made literally all time highs last week. It's impressive. Um, Especially with, with 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 the market looking like that rates may not be being being lowered, but I think think the Nasdaq is being driven more by this by this AI trade and by this just sort of tech, new technology paradigm trade. So again, these are other factors that maybe you know you can you can do a little ARB synthetic. You can be you know long Nasdaq you know when you want to buy something you know versus you know short some Treasuries or whatnot into a Fed decision and 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 play that if you think that maybe the Fed's going to hike. Um, there are ways that you know because risk in general reacts to these events. But the degree of their reactions controlled by some of the more idiosyncratic factors that drive those markets as well. Um, so there you go. Um, to webinar, we're, we're, I'm going to spend the last five minutes here doing some Q&A uh, with my good friend Alex. Um, the webinar five, Monday, February 5th, my wife and I, who is just, she's been so um, profoundly positive for me um, in terms of um, having the right intuition infrastructure. It's something I spent a lot of ink on. And have gone and spoke around the around the world on this subject, Australia, the United States, webinars, um, and I've had the pleasure of just working with a lot of leaders um, in, in in this industry. Um, Eleni is uh, is is another expert in terms of um, having your head right, having your structure right, because there are a lot of risk issues that a lot of traders, you know, learn after the fact when it comes to what compels you, what are your inner demons, and how those inner demons manifest themselves um, in the market. And so. Today's event was, you know, largely, you know, macro fundamental, quantitative. Um, but if you don't have this side, the, the intuition side, if you don't have um, the right emotional state, if you aren't, you know, um, in that place, and that's why I spent a lot of ink in, in, in GME, the Global Macro Edge, on this subject. So I want to dedicate the, the last webinar of this event to that subject. And Eleni is a great um, is a great person to, to to assist me in that project. And we'll talk about some of the things that we do. Um, to, to keep me mentally sharp and, and also how to harness that, 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 that intuition, how to harness that. And, and remember, the, the intuition is the, um, is the synthesis of the analysis performed by our subconscious. And you can, there's just a ton of empirical work out there. I mean, don't take my word for it, but just a lot of empirical work about how our brain stores and processes things, processes things subconsciously. And the, our ability to tap into that can be a real valuable tool when it comes to our trading. And not just our trading, every aspect of our life. So I hope to see you guys in two weeks from now. Um, Eleni and I do, and um, I'll go ahead and spend the last bit of time here, sorry, to take questions. Alex, how you doing, sir? Yes, I'm here enjoying the webinar. Um, I don't get to see any questions right now. I had actually a technicality. We have a very big thunderstorm being here. So I had to be off for five minutes. 
Um, okay. And now I get to see Daniel actually was asking if you were showing something in your screen. And Joseph as well was saying the same thing that they couldn't see in your screen. So what I will do, um, I'm leaving right, right now here my email in case it will be any question for John. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I know what happened. That's amazing. I may not have been on the screen share for this one. Whoops. Because I didn't, I may not have hit the, the share, maybe, maybe on our end, Alex. My apologies for that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, my apologies to everyone um, for if for not, if you had to look at my face the whole time through that, um, hopefully the audio file made it worthwhile. But my, my apologies for not having a corresponding, let me- Well, actually what we can do, John, right? What we can yeah. do, you can send me the slides. You yes. Can send yes, me the course. slides, right? And I'm leaving my email here and we can send all the slides. And if they're going to be having any questions, they can come back. We bring 100%. the questions, we answer them one by one. Actually, yeah. as well, yeah, yeah, don't you don't need to be sorry. It was a, as well, I would say the bad timing. Um, very big thunderstorm here. So um uh, um that online and offline as well. Um, what can we do? Those things are happening, yeah. <laughs> or live, yeah. Yeah. Well, I've broke us. Yeah. So can, here's what I can do real quick. J just, we have a few minutes. Left. I'm going to do a quick visual, like on two minutes, because I just yeah. did the share the th screen thing. So yeah. now you can't see my screen. So I'm going to go just fast forward through this. Oops, that's not ah, dag dynamic. One second. I shared the wrong screen. My apologies. I can literally do a shared screen and get, um, I'm going to close you out. Here we go. Stop sharing the screen. Yeah, I'll do another shared screen. And just for like literally two minutes, I'll run people through. Um, yep, here we go. Okay, share that one. All right, I'm going to put this one on. My sincere apologies, but again, we'll, we'll get this going. So here's here's just the thing. I'm going to run through it. You don't need to hear about that. This is the little the little um, the thing for the mod, the grid for hawkish to, to dovish. This is this is the grid for the four things about you know that that I use in terms of the variables, inflation, outcome, the compound, the rate hikes, and syncretic. All right, so here's a two-year treasury chart I was talking about. It walks through these two-year treasury. This was th that day on a one-minute pace. You can see that move and just how profound that was. Here shows the S&P 500 futures on that day on December 13th, 2024. Again, my sincere apologies. Uh, Euro currency futures from December 13th to December 24, uh, December 13th on that day, how that ripped. Then I'm going back to June 16, 2021. You can see this big sell-off. Same with the S&P. Then on December 19th, wow, that's the big 7% down move there. Again, um, that reversal that we talked about, about six weeks from that, then, which shows that big move there, the interest rate probabilities and the events to watch, and boom. So there you go. We're all caught up, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time. It's still 830. It's still 34 minutes after the hour. You got it all. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Anyway, we do have the contact details. So in case something else needs to be answered, um, of course, more than welcome. Uh, John, it was great uh, having you here again with us tonight. It was very, very useful, the fundamental, the fundamentals today. Um, and I'm looking forward for the next one. I'm looking forward with the next one with Eleni as well. It will be great. Likewise. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Joseph. I see that comment. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the audio, Joseph. Appreciate that. And thank you, Trading Pick community. And uh, you guys have a wonderful, we'll see you in two weeks, everyone. <laughs>
uh, for the Fed events. <coughs> Let's just distill this down into, you know, anything from very hawkish to very dovish and neutral. So there's seven points of contact there 